My name is Sophie Black. I'm the editor of Crikey. I'm your host for this evening. And uh, before we begin, I just have one sentence. This is the most humble day of my life. <laughs> Okay, so it may not have been one of the finest speeches of his career, but uh, those words uttered before the UK Culture Select Committee on Tuesday night were certainly a moment for Rupert Murdoch. Well, that and the whole thing with Wendy and the pie, and, but anyway, we'll brush over that. Whether he likes it or not, Murdoch's words were career-defining, legacy-redefining, a new paragraph, a fresh chapter, a rewrite, and a full stop all in one. In its way, that sentence immediately entered the wider lexicon as a seminal speech. The seven people before you tonight will share some similarly seminal speeches with you this evening. Yes, you are in for a real treat tonight, folks, because Julian Burnside, Sonia Hartnett, Lisa Gorton, Sam Pang, Tony Birch, Dave Graney, and Noni Hazelhurst are all going to talk real fancy. And given that they're all going to do that in an hour, that's my 60 seconds up. So, to kick off proceedings, Julian Burnside QC is an Australian barrister who has captivated courtrooms with his command of the spoken word and has made the odd landmark speech about human rights, particularly in relation to refugees. His chosen tome is a tad more, ex more inspiring than Rupert's humble pie. I give you the Gettysburg Address. Unaccustomed as I am to reading other people's speeches, um, I did choose the Gettysburg Address. It's very famous, it's also very short, and so I thought I'd use um, the rest of my five minutes to put it in context. It's not well understood. In 1776, the American colonists decided uh, that they would break away from England and they signed the Declaration of Independence on the 4th of July. It was the world's first bold experiment in democracy. It was 13 years before the French Revolution. The, uh, the Declaration of Independence is actually a, a long list of complaints about the British government, but it began with a preamble written by Thomas Jefferson, which includes this paragraph, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 87 years after those words were written, uh, the American colonies were, uh, states were engaged in the third year of a bloody civil war. One of the triggers for the Civil War had been the decision of the US Supreme Court in the notorious Dred Scott case. In that case, the Supreme Court had to decide whether those words in the Declaration of Independence applied equally to slaves. And by a majority of seven to two, they held that they did not. Um, at the same time, in, in 1863, President Lincoln was deeply unpopular. The war had claimed 250,000 lives and Lincoln had become conscripting soldiers for the Union Army. The war was evenly balanced and there was a body of opinion that the warring sides should compromise their differences, and, but that would inevitably involve uh, allowing the southern states to retain the practice of slavery. In July of 1863, a great battle was fought in the town of Gettysburg in Pennsylvania. It was a town of just 2,400 people, and at the end of four days of fighting, there were 5,000 slain soldiers, sorry, 7,500 slain soldiers and 5,000 dead horses uh, strewn around the town. It was a decisive win for the Union Army and a turning point in the war. In November 1863, a ceremony was held to consecrate a national, a national cemetery at Gettysburg uh, where the slain were buried. The major speech was given by Edward Everett, a famous orator. He spoke for two hours. Then President Lincoln got up and spoke for two minutes. His purpose was to strengthen the Union's resolve to see the war to a decisive end and thus end slavery in the South. 
His speech was delivered to 150, sorry, to 50, 15,000 people in Gettysburg on the 19th of November, 1863, and it had become one of the most famous speeches in American history. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we're engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We're met on a great battlefield of that war. We've come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honoured dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, that that government of the people, by the people and for the people shall not perish from the earth. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. That's um, stirring stuff. It has echoes, I think, of our own question time. It's uh, yeah, similarly lofty. Next, we have Sonia Hartnett. Now, she's the internationally acclaimed author of several novels for adults and younger readers, including the award-winning Thursday's Child, Of a Boy and Surrender. Her speech promises to be quite monstrous. Sonia Hartnett. Thank you for coming. I'm going to read one of the speeches from Frankenstein, which is full of impressive speeches. It comes from the point in the novel where Victor Frankenstein and his monster, Victor Frankenstein, when his monster starts to come alive, runs off in horror. The monster, enraged by this rejection by his creator, sets off in pursuit and the, the novel is basically about how they uh, play a kind of jigsaw with each other of um, prey and predator. And this is the point where they first meet each other. I won't put on a monster voice because I practiced it at home and it was so stupid. <laughs> Even the dog was looking at me going. <laughs> so. He easily eluded me and said, be calm. I entreat you to hear me before you give vent to your hatred on my devoted head. Have I not suffered enough that you seek to increase my misery? Life, although it may be only an accumulation of anguish, is dear to me, and I will defend it. Remember, thou hast made me more powerful than thyself. My height is superior to thine, my joints more supple. But I will not be tempted to set myself in opposition to thee. I am thy creature, and I will be even mild and docile to my natural lord and king, if thou wilt also perform thy part, that which thou owest me. O oh, Frankenstein, be not equitable to every other, and trample upon me alone, to whom thy justice and even thy clemency and affection is most due. Remember that I am thy creature. I ought to be thy Adam, but I am rather the fallen angel whom thou drivest from joy for no misdeed. Everywhere I see bliss from which I alone am irrevocably excluded. I was benevolent and good. Misery made me a fiend. Make me happy and I shall again be virtuous. How can I move thee? Will no entreaties cause thee to turn a favourable eye upon thy creature who implores thy goodness and compassion? Believe me, Frankenstein, I was benevolent. My soul glowed with love and humanity. But am I not alone, miserably alone? 
You, my creator, abhor me. What hope can I gather from your fellow creatures who owe me nothing? They spurn and hate me. The desert mountains and dreary glaciers are my refuge. I have wandered here many days. The caves of ice, which I only do not fear, are dwellings to me and the only one which man does not grudge. These bleak skies I hail, for they are kinder to me than your fellow beings. If the multitude of mankind knew of my existence, they would do as you do and arm themselves for my destruction. Shall I not then hate them who abhor me? I will keep no terms with my enemies. I am miserable and they shall share my wretchedness. Yet it is in your power to recompense me and deliver them from an evil which it only remains for you to make so great that not only you and your family but thousands of others shall be swallowed up in the whirlwinds of its rage. Let your compassion be moved and do not disdain me. Listen to my tale. When you have heard that, abandon or commiserate me as you shall judge that I deserve. But hear me. The guilty are allowed by human laws, bloody as they are, to speak in their own defence before they are condemned. Listen to me, Frankenstein. You accuse me of murder, and yet you would, with a satisfied conscience, destroy your own creature. Oh, praise the eternal justice of man. Yet I ask you not to spare me. Listen to me, and then, if you can, and if you will, destroy the work of your hands. Hear my tale. It is long and strange, and the temperature of this place is not fitting to your fine sensations. Come to the hut upon the mountain. The sun is yet high in the heavens. Before it descends to hide itself behind your snowy precipices and illuminate another world, you will have heard my story and decide. On you it rests whether I quit forever the neighbourhood of man and lead a harmless life, or become the scourge of your fellow creatures and the author of your own speedy ruin. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia, and I will be hitting you up for a private performance of that monster voice backstage later. Okay, Lisa Gorton's first collection, Press Release, was shortlisted for the Mary Gilmore Award and the Melbourne Prize Best Writing Award and won the Victorian Premier's Prize for Poetry. Tonight, she'll be channeling Virginia Woolf. Hello, I'm going to read an extract from Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own. It was based on some lectures she gave to women's colleges in Cambridge in 1928. Readying myself for this, I came across speeches that I thought more dramatic and um, speeches that I thought more beautiful. But I always remember reading this uh, essay and, and the way it brought into f focus all kinds of diffuse feelings I'd had. Um, I should say when she mentions the professor in this extract, she's referring to Professor von X, engaged in writing his monumental work, The Mental, Moral and Physical Inferiority of the Female Sex. <laughs> Waiting to be served, I began idly reading the headlines. A ribbon of very large letters ran across the page. Somebody had made a big score in South Africa. Lesser ribbons announced that Sir Austin Chamberlain was at Geneva. A meat axe with human hair on it had been found in a cellar. Mr. Justice commented in the divorce courts upon the shamelessness of women. Sprinkled about the paper were other pieces of news. A film actress had been lowered from a peak in California and hung suspended in mid-air. The weather was going to be foggy. The most transient visitor to this planet, I thought, who picked up this paper, could not fail to be aware, even from this scattered testimony, that England is under the rule of a patriarchy. Nobody in their senses could fail to detect the dominance of the professor. His was the power and the money and the influence. He was the proprietor of the paper and its editor and sub-editor. He was the foreign secretary and the judge he was the cricketer. He owned the racehorses and the yachts. He was the director of the company that pays 200% to its shareholders. He left millions to charities and colleges that were ruled by himself. 
he suspended the film actress in mid-air. He will decide if the hair on the meat axe is human. He it is who will acquit or convict the murderer and hang him or let him go free. With the exception of the fog, he seemed to control everything. Yet he was angry. I knew that he was angry by this token. When I read what he wrote about women, I thought not of what he was saying, but of himself. When an arguer argues dispassionately, he thinks only of the argument, and the reader cannot help thinking of the argument too. If he had written dispassionately about women, had used indisputable proofs to establish his argument, and had shown no trace of wishing that the result should be one thing rather than another, one would not have been angry either. One would have accepted the fact, as one accepts the fact that a pea is green or a canary yellow. So be it, I should have said. But I had been angry, because he was angry. Yet it seemed absurd, I thought, turning over the evening paper, that a man with all this power should be angry. Or is anger, I wondered, somehow the familiar, the attendant sprite on power? Rich people, for example, are often angry because they suspect that the poor want to seize their wealth. The professors, or patriarchs as it might be more accurate to call them, might be angry for that reason partly, but partly for one that lies a little less obviously on the surface. Possibly they were not angry at all. Often indeed they were admiring, devoted, exemplary in the relations of private life. Possibly when the professor insisted a little too emphatically upon the inferiority of women, he was concerned not with their inferiority but with his own superiority. That was what he was protecting, hot-headedly, and with too much emphasis, because it was a jewel to him of the rarest price. Life for both sexes, and I looked at them, shouldering their way along the pavement, is arduous, difficult, a perpetual struggle. It calls for gigantic courage and strength. More than anything, perhaps, creatures of illusion as we are, it calls for confidence in oneself. Without self-confidence, we are as babes in the cradle. And how can we generate this imponderable quality, which is yet so invaluable, most quickly, by thinking that other people are inferior to oneself, by feeling that one has some innate superiority, it may be wealth, or rank, a straight nose, or the portrait of a grandfather by Romney, for there is no end to the pathetic devices of the human imagination. Hence the enormous importance to a patriarch who has to conquer, who has to rule, of feeling that great numbers of people, half the human race indeed, are by nature inferior to himself. Women have served all these centuries as looking glasses, possessing the magic and delicious power of reflecting the figure of man at twice its natural size. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. Not bad for a lady. <laughs> uh, next we have Sam Pang. Sam is a presenter, writer, broadcaster and producer who began his media career with 3CR Community Radio, graduating to independent Melbourne radio station Triple R. You can currently catch his wit and wisdom on the web series The Match Committee. And tonight, for your listening pleasure, he shall be presenting a pithy yet moving piece from popular film, I believe. Sam. Thank you, Sophie. And uh, it's nothing that comforting when you're um, sitting there and you listen to Lisa and Sonia and you realise you've made a very poor choice. But um, <laughs> that's fine. I didn't uh, mention you, uh, Julian, only because I originally, when I was asked to do this, I actually had an idea uh, about the Gettysburg, that day at Gettysburg. I actually wanted to read Edward Everett's. <laughs> 3,000, uh, 13,000 plus word uh, speech, but uh, the Wheeler Centre decided to go with yours, and uh, I'm sure they regret that very much. Um, I hope you don't mind uh, if uh, I change the, the tone a little bit. I'm um, thematically what I've decided to uh, go with is uh, it's a speech about heartache and uh, vulnerability, uh, it's about hope. 
It's about love, love lost and found and lost again. And uh, essentially, though, it's about a girl standing in front of a boy <laughs> asking him to love her. So I know when we all think of love, we think of Julia Roberts' character, Anna Scott from Notting Hill. And um, everyone, everyone here seen that movie? Well, for the sake of those here uh, tonight pretending they haven't, um, <laughs> I'll just set the scene and tell you that Anna Scott is a world famous actress laying her heart on the line to local bookshop owner William Thacker, played by the adorable Hugh Grant. <laughs> and um, Anna is standing in William's bookstore uh, in a simple blue skirt and top. <laughs> which which I was going to wear, but I, <laughs> I thought I'd let the, the words tell the story. Also, for the sake of the night uh, and getting off as quickly as I can, I, I'm, not gonna, I'm just going to do Anna's uh, lines, not William's, so <laughs> just fill in the blanks. <laughs> Hi. You disappeared. How have you been? Oh no, it's all nonsense. Believe me, I had no idea how much nonsense it was, but nonsense it all is. Well, yesterday was our last day of filming, so I'm leaving. But I brought this for you from home, so I thought I'd give it to you. Oh no, don't open it now. I'll be embarrassed. The acting's very similar to how I'm reading it too, by the way. I should not say <laughs> I actually had it in my apartment, and I thought, but when it came to it, I didn't know how to call, having behaved so badly, twice. So it's just been sitting in the hotel. Then you came and I figured, the thing is, I have to go away today. But I wondered, if I didn't, whether you might let me see you a little, or a lot maybe. See if you could like me again. William leaves and then he comes back. That's fine, there's always, a, there's always a pause when the jury goes out to consider their verdict. Yes, fine, of course, of course. Well, I'll just be going then, it was nice to see you. That really is a real no, isn't it? Fine, fine. Good decision, good decision. The fame thing isn't really real, you know. And don't forget, all together now, I'm also just a girl standing in front of a boy asking him to love her. She kisses him on the cheek. Goodbye. And scene. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I'm just going to bit of a tear there. That's, uh, I thought you'd overreach, it was a little bit too highbrow, but I think you really held everyone in the palm of your hand there, Sam. That was, that was very moving. Uh, right, now, Tony Birch is a Melbourne writer and teacher whose short fiction, poetry and creative non-fiction have been published wide, widely. He has also worked as a writer and curator in collaboration with photographers, filmmakers and artists. And tonight he's intercepted a piece of correspondence to read to you. Tony Birch. Um, thank you very much. All the big laughs were coming from the back of the room, Sam, so obviously you've snuck your family in. Um, <laughs> when I was asked to be involved in this, the first thing I thought about was work that I've done over about 15 years, and that is looking very closely at the activism of Aboriginal women on Victorian reserves and missions from the late 19th century to the first half of the 20th century. These women were great orators, they made great soapbox speeches on the reserves, speeches on kitchen tables, speeches in community halls. But unlike some of the great speeches that we've seen tonight, they were never recorded and often not witnessed. But I wanted to pay tribute to the, the politics and the, the intellect 
and the eloquence of these women. And one of the things I spoke to Claire about when I said I wanted to take part in this is to get a sense of what these women were saying in these speeches from their similar letters of correspondence to the Chief Secretary of the Victorian Government. So I want to just give you, with a little commentary, a short narrative of two of these women in particular, the sort of struggles they were up against, the way they articulated that struggle for all Aboriginal women and the responses that they got from the Victorian Government. And tonight I want to read for, for my grandmother um, Diddy Mooney and my great-grandmother Nini Moody. Okay. In January 1917, Ada Austin, an Aboriginal woman living on the Framlingham Reserve, wrote to the Victorian Board of Protection of Aborigines, asking that her niece, Winnie Austin, 12 years of age, be able to live with her. She wrote, I have come to Lake Conda to see my niece, Winnie Austin. If I can take her home again, this, this child I will have in my home, living with me since she was born. And besides, she is not a strong girl. She is very delicate. She is too young to go out and work. Mrs Galbraith, the manager's wife, gives her a good report and good character, and she has learnt enough now to come home and keep house. A short time later, Ada again wrote to the BPA, more forthright in her opinion of the conditions to which Winnie had lived at Lake Conda and the impact of the separation on the Austin family. My niece, Winnie Austin, a girl of 14 years, went to Conda two years ago. When she wanted to come home to her mother, they refused to let her come home, not even to see her mother. And I heard that she'd been treated very harshly by the woman manager and all her letters are opened. I know from friends that she is treated badly, though it is more than she would dare to let me know. It seems because we are black people that they can do what they like with us. They ought to treat us all alike, as we got relations fighting at the front, and they should never treat our children like this. Despite Ada's plea, the BPA refused her permission to have Winnie stay either with her or Winnie's own mother, Lena. And still Ada persisted in a following letter to Mrs Ann Bond, a supporter of Aboriginal people. Our dear brave soldier boys got killed at the front. There's none that came back alive. My brother, brother-in-law, and Winnie's uncles and cousins, and my nephew, all done their share to help make Australia free. And this is how the government is treating us. We all know that you are a good Christian lady and a good white heart, and help your God from heaven, that he may guide you to feel for the poor black girl and get her back. Lena Winnie's mother also wrote to the Chief Secretary, Mr McLeod, in March 1917. Dear Sir, I am thinking about my poor little girl, Winnie. She is longing to come home again to her own native part. You know that it is quite natural for a child to come home to her own mother and relations. My sister got a letter from Winnie telling her that Mrs Galbraith is treating her very unkindly. She knocked her head against the door and she struck her. She said to Winnie, you haven't got your old Aunt Ada to take care of you now. She told us that if she is left there much longer, she will die. Mrs Galgrave is overworking her. She got her up at the house working her too much and she have to get up at six o'clock in the morning and scrub before she go to school and she have to work when she comes out again. The next month, Lena wrote directly to Winnie. The poignancy of the letter provides an insight into the devastating effect that the separation was having on all of the family. My dear darling daughter, I now write you these few lines, hoping it will find you in good health. You don't know how much I long for you. I'm always thinking about you and your Auntie Ada also. Your poor little brothers, Willie and Chris, they are always saying, when is our sister Winnie coming home again? The BPA wrote back to the Austin sisters, informing them that Winnie would be leaving Lake Conda, but she would not be returning to her family at Framlingham. It was decided that she would be sent several hundred miles away to a salvation home in East Kew, Melbourne, where it would not be possible for the family to contact her at all. In 1921, Ada Austin wrote what would be most likely her final letter to Mrs Bond. It provides an insight into the terrible living conditions that the family was subject to and the tragic consequences of this ongoing separation. The weather is very cold and my house is very damp. We are hard up much for blankets. I need warm blankets. 
My little kitchen is always very wet and miserable. Lena is crippled nearly for years now and very thin. She is always suffering. With kindest love and best wishes, please excuse me for writing. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Thanks for sharing that heartbreaking letter trail. Dave Graney is an ARIA award-winning, gold record-wearing, bad-ass music, mu musician? It's not bad-ass, is it? It's bad-ass. You've got to own it. Okay. With a recording output comprising roughly 24 albums in a career spanning 30 years. That's a lot of liner notes. In his downtime, he wrote a book. It's called 1001 Australian Nights. Tonight, he's lending his mellifluous voice to a piece from the Russian revolutionary poet Mayakovsky entitled Brooklyn Bridge. Dave Graham. Thank you for that introduction. Very impressive company I find myself in here. Uh, I was going to read a letter by Vladimir Mayakovsky from his humbly titled book from 1925, My Discovery of America. <laughs> he was a, I'm reading a poem from him. He's a futurist poet, and I thought it was worthy of a speech because he writes in a very declamatory style, in, uh, as if he's on top of a, a building talking to the world. And uh, in the book, uh, he, he's uh, brought to America through Mexico. He's a kind of an outlaw figure, a revolutionary poet, and he cannot speak any English. He, he enters America through Mexico, and he's a totally in a totally foreign world. And I'll, I'll preface it with a bit. He's describing what it's like to be in America. Actually, the book starts with two words. Mayakovsky starts the book with two words, and the two words are, two words, <laughs> exclamation mark. So he likes to get your attention. <laughs> Probably foreigners have some respect for me, but it's also possible they consider me an idiot. I won't say anything about Russians for the moment. You've only got to take my American situation. They've invited over a poet, so they've been told, a genius, genius, that's even better than famous. So I turn up and straight away I say, Give me, please, some tea. Okay, they give me some. I wait a while and once more. Give me, please. Again, they give me some more. And I do it again and again in different tones of voice and varying my expression. Give me, yeah, some tea. Some tea, yeah, give me, I enunciate. And so the evening rolls on. Alert, deferential old men listen, admire, and think, oh, that's the Russian for you. Won't say a word more than he has to. I think a Tolstoy, the North. It won't enter his head that I don't have a word of English, that my tongue is jumping up and down and twisting like a corkscrew from the urge to speak, that hoisting my tongue like a hoopla ring, I am desperately trying to string together in a comprehensible manner the various requisite vowels and consonants. It wouldn't enter an American's head that I am convulsively giving birth to wild supra-English phrases. So now I'll read you what he is, says in his language in a master um, a master of uh, linguist has translated it into English. It's called Brooklyn Bridge. This is what was going on in his mind in, in the world that he couldn't uh, express himself. Let's hear it, Coolidge, your joyful cry. For what's good, I too won't stint on the words. From these praises, blush redder than the flag of our own soil, though indeed you be the all United States of America. Just as to his church creeps the deranged believer, as though retreating to a cloister strict and frugal, so I, in an evening, graying semblance, walk in all humility onto Brooklyn Bridge. Just as into a subjugated city the conqueror shoves his cannons, their muzzles giraffe high, so I, inebriated in eulogy, ready to feast, mount, feeling proud, onto Brooklyn Bridge. 
As a fatuous artist on a museum's Madonna thirst his eye, love sick and keen, so I, down from heavens scattered to the stars, look upon New York through Brooklyn Bridge. New York, until evening so tough and sultry, has forgotten its toughness and its height, and only house sprite souls appear in the translucence of fenestral light. Here there's hardly a tingle of an elevated chuff, and only by such quiet tingling can you know trains run jangling through with sounds like clearing dishes in the buffet. And when, or thus it seemed, from where a rivulet starts, a tradesman is delivering sugar from his mill. It's just passing through masts below bridge, of a size no more than pin-sized. I'm proud of this very mile of steel. That's where, alive, my visions can arise, a struggle for constructions over style, severe reckonings of screws and steel. If there should come an end to the world and chaos would rip the planet asunder and just the one remaining thing should be this above the dust of ruin, this rearing bridge, then just as from bones even leaner than needles they fatten up big lizards that stand in museums, so from this bridge our geologist of the epochs would succeed in recreating the days of now. He will say, so this is the pour of steel that united the seas with the prairie and it's from here Europe strained to the west, having scattered Indian feathers to the winds. There's memory of machinery in this rib. Just imagine, would hands suffice placing a steel foot on Manhattan to haul up Brooklyn by the lip? By the leads of electrical strands, I know, it's the era following steam. It's when people already yelled over radio. It's when people already flew by plane. It's when living was for some free and easy for others, a hungry and extended howl. It's from here that the jobless into the Hudson pitched head first. And beyond this, my picture becomes snag-free. And on cable-like strings, it plays right up to the stars. I can see that here stood Mayakovsky. Here he stood, synthesizing his strophes by the syllable. I keep looking at it like an Eskimo at a train, sticking at it like ticks stick to ears. Brooklyn Bridge, yeah, it's something else. <laughs> getting fit. Now that's owning the stage. Okay, now finally we have Noni Hazel Hazelhurst who is of course one of Australia's favourite actors and presenters. Also an entire generation of people about my age are overwhelmed by an insatiable urge to cuddle her. <laughs> her recent, uh, her most recent and seminal work was of course the important groundbreaking rendition of go the fuck to sleep. She swears magnificently. Let's see if she can top that tonight. Noni Hazelhurst. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, when I was asked to do this, I really thought what a great opportunity to point out the, the lack of oratory skills and inspirational speeches that our current politicians seem to have. And it seemed like a good moment to go back to Don Watson, who's such a wonderful, wonderful speechwriter and who's sorely missed. And I stopped dead at the Redfern speech, uh, the speech that Keating made on the 10th of December 1992 at Redfern Park in Sydney. And the speech dealt with the challenges faced by Indigenous Australians. And as I read it, I just became sadder and sadder at how far backwards we've gone in so many ways. This is 20 years ago, and as you will hear, the optimism which is embodied in this speech has wavered. And I choose to pay my respects to the traditional owners of this land, the Kulin people. That's my choice. And I also dedicate this reading to David Numajara, the Aboriginal actor who was found dead in a park a few days ago. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to be here today at the launch of Australia's celebration of the 1993 International Year of the World's Indigenous People. This will be a year of great significance for Australia. It comes at a time when we have committed ourselves to succeeding in the test which so far we have always failed. Because in truth we cannot confidently say that we have succeeded as we would like to have succeeded if we have not managed to extend opportunity and care, dignity and hope to the Indigenous people of Australia, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. This is a fundamental test of our social goals and our national will. Our ability to say to ourselves and the rest of the world that Australia is a first-rate social democracy. That we are what we should be. Truly the land of the fair go and the better chance. There is no more basic test of how seriously we mean these things. It is a test of our self-knowledge, of how well we know the land we live in, how well we know our history, how well we recognise the fact that, complex as our contemporary identity is, it cannot be separated from Aboriginal Australia. How well we know what Aboriginal Australians know about Australia. Redfern is a good place to contemplate these things. Just a mile or two from the place where the first European settlers landed. In too many ways it tells us that their failure to bring much more than devastation and demoralisation to Aboriginal Australia continues to be our failure. More, I think, than most Australians recognise. The plight of Aboriginal Australians affects us all. In Redfern, it might be tempting to think that the reality Aboriginal Australians face is somehow contained here and that the rest of us are insulated from it. But of course, while all the dilemmas may exist here, they are far from contained. We know the same dilemmas and more are faced all over Australia. This is perhaps the point of this year of the world's Indigenous people, to bring the dispossessed out of the shadows, to recognise that they are part of us and that we cannot give Indigenous Australians up without giving up many of our own most deeply held values, much of our own identity and indeed our own humanity. Nowhere in the world, I would venture, is the message more stark than it is in Australia. We simply cannot sweep injustice aside. Even if our own conscience allowed us to, I am sure that in due course the world and the people of our region would not. There should be no mistake about this. Our success in resolving these issues will have a significant bearing on our standing in the world. However intractable the problems seem, we cannot resign ourselves to failure any more than we can hide behind our political opponent's contemporary version of social Darwinism, which says that to reach back for the poor and dispossessed is to risk being dragged down. That seems to me not only morally indefensible, but bad history. We non-Aboriginal Australians should perhaps remind ourselves that Australia once reached out for us. Didn't Australia provide opportunity and care for the dispossessed Irish, for the poor of Britain, the refugees from war and famine and persecution in the countries of Europe and Asia? Isn't it reasonable to say that if we can build a prosperous and remarkably harmonious multicultural society in Australia, surely we can find just solutions to the problems which beset the first Australians? the people to whom the most injustice has been done. And as I say, the starting point might be to recognise that the problems start with us, the non-Aboriginal Australians. It begins, I think, with the act of recognition. Recognition that it was we who did the dispossessing. We took the tradi traditional lands and smashed the traditional way of life. We brought the diseases, the alcohol, we committed the murders. We took the children from their mothers. 
we practised discrimination and exclusion. It was our ignorance and our prejudice. And our failure to imagine these things could be done to us. With some noble exceptions, we failed to make the most basic human response and enter into their hearts and their minds. We failed to ask, how would I feel if this were done to me? As a consequence, we failed to see that what we were doing degraded all of us. If we needed a reminder of this, we received it this year in the report of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, which showed with devastating clarity that the past lives on in inequality, racism and injustice, in the prejudice and ignorance of non-Aboriginal Australians and in the demoralisation and desperation, the fractured identity of so many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. For all this, I do not believe that the report should fill us with guilt. Down the years, there's been no shortage of guilt, but it has not produced the response we need. Guilt, I think we've all learned, is not a very constructive emotion. I think what we need to do is open our hearts a bit, all of us. Perhaps when we recognise what we have in common, we will see the things which must be done the practical things. There is something of this in the creation of the Council for Ab Aboriginal Reconciliation. The Council's mission is to forge a new partnership built on justice and equity and an appreciation of the heritage of Australia's Indigenous people. In the abstract, those terms are meaningless. We have to give meaning to justice and equity. And as I have said several times this year, we will only give the meaning when we commit ourselves to achieving concrete results. If we improve the living conditions in one town, they will improve in another and another. If we raise the standard of health by 20% one year, it will be raised more the next. If we open one door, others will follow. When we see improvement, we will see more dignity, more confidence, more happiness. Then we will know we are going to win. We need these practical building blocks of change. The Mabo judgment should be seen as one of these. By doing away with the bizarre conceit that this continent had no owners prior to the settlement of Europeans, Mabo establishes a fundamental truth and lays the basis for justice. It will be much easier to work from that basis than has ever been the case in the past. For this reason alone, we should ignore the isolated outbreaks of hysteria and hostility to Mabo of the past few months. Mabo is an historic decision. We can make it an historic turning point, the basis of a new relationship between Indigenous and non-Aboriginal Australians. The message should be that there is nothing to fear or to lose in the recognition of historical truth or the extension of social justice or the deepening of Australian social democracy to include Indigenous Australians. There is everything to gain. Even the unhappy past speaks for this. Where Aboriginal Australians have been included in the life of Australia, they have made remarkable contributions, economic contributions, particularly in the pastoral and agricultural industry. They are there in the frontier and exploration history of Australia. They are there in the wars, in sport to an extraordinary degree, and in literature and art and music. In all these things, they have shaped our knowledge of this continent and of ourselves. They have shaped our identity. They are there in the Australian legend. And we should never forget they helped build this nation. And if we have a sense of justice as well as common sense, we will forge a new partnership. As I said, it might help us if we non-Aboriginal Australians imagined ourselves dispossessed of land we've lived on for 50,000 years, and then imagined ourselves told that it had never been ours. 
Imagine if ours was the oldest culture in the world and we were told that it was worthless. Imagine if we had resisted this settlement, suffered and died in the defence of our land and then were told in history books that we had given up without a fight. Imagine if non-Aboriginal Australians had served their country in peace and war and were then ignored in history books. Imagine if our feats on sporting fields had inspired admiration and patriotism and yet did nothing to diminish prejudice. Imagine if our spiritual life was denied and ridiculed. Imagine if we had suffered the injustice and then were blamed for it. It seems to me if we can imagine the injustice, then we can imagine its opposite. And we can have justice. I say that for two reasons. I say it because I believe that the great things about Australian social democracy reflect a fundamental belief in justice. And I say it because in so many other areas we have proved our capacity over the years to go on extending the realms of participation, opportunity and care. Just as Australians living in the relatively narrow and insular Australia of the 1960s imagined a culturally diverse, worldly and open Australia, and in a generation turned the idea into reality, so we can turn the goals of reconciliation into reality. There are very good signs that the process has begun. The creation of the Reconciliation Council is evidence itself. The establishment of ATSIC. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission is also evidence. The Council is the product of imagination and goodwill. ATSIC emerges from the vision of Indigenous self-determination and self-management. The vision has already become the reality of almost 800 elected Aboriginal regional councillors and commissioners determining priorities and developing their own programs. All over Australia, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities are taking charge of their own lives and assistance with the problems which chronically beset them is at last being made available in ways developed by the communities themselves. If these things offer hope, so does the fact that this generation of Australians is better informed about Aboriginal culture and achievement and about the injustice that has been done than any generation before. We're beginning to more generally appreciate the depth and the diversity of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures from their music and art and dance, we are beginning to recognise how much richer our national life and identity will be for the participation of Aboriginals and Torres Strait Islanders. We're beginning to learn what the Indigenous people have known for many tens of thousands of years, how to live with our physical environment. Ever so gradually, we're learning to see Australia through Aboriginal eyes beginning to recognise the wisdom contained in their epic story. I think we are beginning to see how much we owe Indigenous Australians and how much we have lost by living so apart. I said we non-Indigenous Australians should try to imagine the Aboriginal view. Can't be too hard. Someone imagined this event today and it is now a marvellous reality and a great reason for hope. There is one thing today we cannot imagine. We cannot imagine that the descendants of people whose genius and resilience maintained a culture here through 50,000 years or more, through cataclysmic changes to the climate and the environment, and who then survived two centuries of dispossession and abuse, will be denied their place in the modern Australian nation. We cannot imagine that. We cannot imagine that we will fail. And with the spirit that is here today, I'm confident that we won't. I'm confident that we will succeed in this decade. Thank you very much for listening to me. Isn't that sad?
Thank you, Noni. The more things change. That was our final speech for this evening. So uh, I hope you go, all go out into the cold night with uh, invigorated and inspired brains by the speeches this evening. So um, if you can join me in thanking Julian Burnside, Sonia Hartnett, Lisa Gorton, Sam Pang, Tony Birch, Dave Graney, and Noni Hazelhurst.